Firstly, let's begin with some key things I refer to key heuristics. These are good rules of thumb based on validating knowledge of learning that relates to good teaching. What I call the core principles of learning. There's 10 of these in the next two slides. You won't digest it all at once, but you can download the slides, think about it and communicate on Padlet. Essentially, these are things that can, if implemented well, enhance the learning experience for students. So let's work through these. It's only going to be a key summary. Firstly, if you can, when you teach, have some kind of motivational strategy. And what that means is don't just go in with content slides copied from a textbook. Try to make it interesting in terms of perhaps an initial story, some good examples, a interesting video clip, um, some key questions, a big headline uh, in a newspaper relating to the topic. Uh, this is where creativity does come in. It's a big area. Think about how you can make the learning more interesting, relevant, connected with the student group. This one, very technical. It certainly helps learning your students know what they need to learn and they can see that it has some value, some purpose. So communicate this clearly. Often this can be done in what's called an advanced organiser, which is a summary of what's going on in the lesson. A little bit what I'm trying to do here now. Thirdly, if we don't know what students already know, how do we pitch our lesson? So again, find out what they know at the beginning of the topic. That will help you then to connect the new knowledge to the old. If they know nothing, then you're starting at ground zero. If they know a lot, then don't teach them what they already know. It would be pretty boring. Again, um, it's not true that students have different learning styles, but what we do know is that if we use different methods of presentation, um, that is more likely to be uh, more interesting because quite simply it will engage the range of the senses. The visual sense is probably the most strongest, but if we give students different methods, modes of presentation, Better chance it will be motivating, better chance that it will get better attention and learning. Okay, number five, don't teach everything about the topic. This is really important. Focus on those key concepts and principles. What are the big understandings that students need to, to get a feel of the structure of the subject? Um, this is really important thing and comes with experience of teaching. Okay, we're moving on. Number six, it helps if you can get students thinking. In fact, students don't really like thinking too much. They'd rather be spoon fed. But thinking is really important because what it does, it helps to connect the various bits of knowledge and build understanding. So getting students to analyse, to compare and contrast, to evaluate, to look at different data sources and make inferences and interpretations, it's good for learning. Though the students might find it a bit tiring, it's worth persisting with. Now, this is a big one because we know that our memory systems have two main systems. Long-term memory, which can store lots and lots of stuff, but a working memory system, which you're in now, that has limited capacity to about seven plus or minus two bits. And that's a, um, that's a best um, approximation. There are some people who think it's even less. Um, what's really important about memory in terms of practical teaching is to chunk up the topic. Don't present too much information too quickly. Chunk it up and provide students with transitions so they can see the various chunks and how they fall together. And if you want to develop skills, they will need practice, but not just any practice, but deliberate practice. This is where you look at where the students are now and you give them things to do that are attainable um, given their existing level of competence. Don't make it too difficult because it don't work. So it's about getting the practice to build the skills in relation to where students are. Nearly there. We know a big factor that helps students to learn is good feedback. And that's where assessment should be an ongoing process, not just for measuring the learning, but as part of the instructional strategy. Because in this way, it's called formative assessment. 
we can identify where students are and give them the right quality feedback about where they are on the task, how they may require to think about the task a bit differently, or even manage ourselves. Feedback, very important principle of learning. And finally, something I've always known is that make a good psychological climate. And this is about the, the way students feel in the class. And do they feel that they can have a bit of fun? Do they feel that they can ask questions? Do they feel that um, they are respected and trusted? And that there is an emphasis that with effort, they can be successful. A very big area to work on. As a teacher, if you can create a good psychological climate, a lot of other things come together. So these are some key things we now know from research, from our understanding of learning, that will help our teaching and will certainly help student attainment in a learning experience. Let's move on. Now, these core principles, how they work. Well, each one focuses on a particular aspect of learning, activating prior knowledge, psychological climate, memory. They work as a dynamic system. So the more that you can use these thoughtfully in relation to the student, Nice quote here, you can reflect on that in your own time, but it is a very powerful one and captures what we're talking about in this context. And again, that when you apply these core principles, always remember that there are situational factors. Uh, and they will depend on the learning outcomes, for example. If students have got to recall a lot of information, you don't really want to get them doing high level thinking such as analysis and evaluation and also their own characteristics if they've got high motivational level you don't have to work terribly hard on the motivational side when i teach master's degree students i haven't got to motivate them getting the qualification and having to pay sixteen thousand dollars to do the stuff usually is sufficient and also the context the environment the research facilities resources available so always bear that in mind when you use these core principles, think about the student profile. Okay, now let's move on to teaching methods. Not only do we know a lot about learning, but we also now, uh, particularly through the work of John Hattie, um, who over a 15 year period did a, 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 what's called a meta-analysis, an overview analysis of what teaching methods work best. Now, you can, Google John Atty's um, IFX size teaching methods if you want to know more. But I've just picked out five here that are particularly important for student attainment. You'll notice there is a mean effect size on the uh, right hand side. And you might be saying, well, what does that mean? The next slide will do that. But good feedback, fundamental. Old class interactive teaching where students do a variety of things. Strategy changing challenging goals, giving them advanced organisers. These are all things that have a high effect size. What does an effect size look like? Well, a standard deviation of 1.0 is massive. Advancing learners' achievement by one year, improving the rate of learning is two grade leaping DCSE grades. This is the technical definition. You can look at that in your own time. And Let's look at this, that even in one year, we would expect students to move up 0.40. So anything that we do that has an effect size over 4.0 are particularly interesting and relevant. Some other important considerations about effect size. Nice quote from John Atty there, the Russian dolls. Do you know what they are? They're dolls that fit into each other. And what John means here is if we can combine a number of high effect methods in our teaching as part of the overall strategy, then that's going to add an even more powerful effect. And the final point here is that it's important to balance effect size with level of difficulty of interventions. For example, advanced organisers, uh, which are summaries in advance of the teaching, has an effect size of 0.45. Okay, not massive, but it only takes about three minutes the beginning of a lesson. So, pretty useful thing to do. Okay, that's a bit of an overview. Do digest this. There is an online tutorial just on this area of evidence-based teaching, which you can access 
a link will be provided. But this should give you a good taste of what we mean by applying what we know about learning and what methods work best to the way we design and facilitate the learning experience.